if you buy in your personal name, you cannot isolate those liabilities because it's your personal name. If you buy income producing assets, income producing debt, in stru you structure the purchases in, in trusts, companies, etc. Essentially, that's not you, that's a separate entity that you could potentially isolate the liabilities of that entity and therefore not held accountable for those liabilities. And if it washes its own face, etc., you can then essentially borrow again and again. Hello and welcome. You are listening to Dashdot Insider, the auditory epicenter for passionate property investors seeking a life of freedom, choice, and abundance. My name is Emil Pinder. I am your host for today. And today we are joined by Andy Bernardos, and we're going to tackle one of the biggest questions or one of the biggest problems in property investment these days, the biggest mistake that property investors make. We're going to get into that. We're also going to talk about the three C's, the three constraints that can have a massive impact. Apparently, we're going to dig into this and we're going to test Andy's ideas on your ability to accumulate property and build wealth. We're going to get into that very, very shortly. But first up, just so you know who Andy is, Andy, it is great to be with you. Uh, I've wanted to do this episode for a while because there is so much more about property that casual investors like I used to be don't know. And there's still tons for us to learn. And because there's so much info that some of us don't know, we miss out on some really good opportunities and make mistakes along the way that can set up your portfolio uh, or, or can set your portfolio, I should say, back by years and years and years. So a little bit about your background just to kick off. I understand that there's some engineering in there, but can you sort of uh, tell us who you are? Yeah, well, really excited to have this conversation with you, Emil. Uh, basically, I'm Andy. I am a senior portfolio strategist at Dashdot, and I was born and raised in Spain been in Australia for four years now, and my background actually is in manufacturing and engineering, so that's what I did before I joined Dashdot. How how does that sort of background, does that background have any impact or any usefulness in property investing? Well, yeah, at the end of the day, it's all about the numbers, right? It's uh, They operate in a very similar fashion. So basically, in a portfolio, you have your initial conditions and your boundaries, right? And then you have a set of inputs, a system, which is your portfolio with the properties and an outcome or set of outcomes. And so in property investor language, you have your your capital, you've got your, your deposit on a property, you've got your cash flow, your income, your salary, your expenses. Then you have this thing called a property portfolio. And then that produces an outcome that is sort of like, your dream. This is this is what you want to get out of out of wealth creation, out of property, etc. Pretty close. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yep. So all of those are your inputs, right? As you said, borrowing capacity, cash flow, capital, uh, all your cir circumstances, boundaries, roadblocks, etc. That's your inputs. Then you have the system, which is a portfolio, and then you have your outcomes, which is what are you trying to achieve? What is it that you want property to do for you? And of course, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, you go. <laughs> and yeah, of course, a, a factory, for example, which is kind of what I was, the, the domain that I used to work at, is very similar. So engineering, manufacturing, factories, it's really similar. You have a set of inputs, you have your boundaries and constraints and everything. You have the system, which is the factory with the machines, and then you have your final product or products, which is the outcome. So at the end of the day, and also it happened to be, it didn't even matter what you were manufacturing. The system, the process is exactly the same. And then it translates to property really, really well. And so your role is basically optimizing that process just as you would with an engine or in a factory or something like that. You want to optimize the process to get people to their goal faster. Let's go then straight into the big the big mistake, right? We've we've set up this this podcast. We're calling it the big mistake everybody makes. Well, a lot of people make in property investing. So I want to run through for you what I consider to be a fairly typical scenario that a property investor or a prospective property investor might go through as they begin their property journey. And then I want to tell you whether or not I've made the mistake or whether or not I got lucky. <laughs> I got lucky and it's like, no, no, that's actually what I'd recommend. Fair enough? 
Fair enough. So let's say um, probably 30, let's imagine, let's, let's wind back the clock a little bit, say 15 years or so. Let's imagine that I'm 30, 31, 32, something like that, uh, married, maybe have a child, maybe one on the way. This is all hypothetical, obviously. Um, combined income? maybe hundred somewhere between one hundred and thirty and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So I finally accumulated enough capital there to think, all right, it's time to get a property. I've looked around, worked out an area that I really want to live in. Good schools, has a nice sort of feel. It might be one of these uh, suburbs, sort of um, outer suburbs in one of the main centers like a Brisbane, somewhere like that, where you know they're popping up these estates, these Barbie villas. And uh, I'm thinking, right, that's, that looks like a nice place to live. Uh, we'll probably get some growth and then we'll be able gradually to move closer and closer to the middle of the city where we want to live further down the track. Could be Brisbane, could be Sydney, could be the Gold Coast. Or in fact, in the Gold Coast, it's not more towards the center. It's sort of moving more closer and closer to the beach. And uh, let's say we have a car. Car has a, a loan of about 15 grand on it, something like that. I uh, probably got two cars, so maybe combined debt on the cars of twenty grand, twenty-five grand, something like that. It's usually it's usually pretty easy to get car finance on a reasonable salary, and um, and so then I've gone and I've bought that first property, looking around in my in the same area because I know the area very well. I've researched everything. I've looked at every property in the area that has sold for the last six months, checking realestate.com.au every single day, making sure I know the area, I know which streets I can. I can pick a little bargain in my suburb. I know where there's a lot of noise, where you know kids are racing late in the evening, all of that stuff. And I've gone, I've found a, another decent property for say four hundred grand. And I'm thinking, right, that's that's what I'm going to buy. And I go and buy that. And I've bought everything in my own name or with my wife's uh, in partnership with my wife, so joint names. And we put everything because we're clever into a mortgage offset account. So that means that the the uh, any savings that we have as we accumulate more capital can then just be bumped off and be the deposit of a new property. We don't need to refinance the loan that we have. So we, we think we're pretty clever because we've done that. So with that scenario, which took a little while to set up, have I made a mistake? Okay. Well, I took a couple notes. Let me, let me think about it. So first of all, if you find a four hundred thousand dollar property in Brisbane. Let me know straight away, and I'll be on it straight yeah, away. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's say it's five hundred. That's a good point. Actually, Still. that's a really good point. Okay, so <laughs> okay, that's one of them, right? Yeah. But we'll we'll get to that in a minute. So, let's see a couple of quick ones, right? A bit out of our domain, but would be the twenty k and car loans, bad debts, right? And the fact that if it's their principal place of residence, they'll typically typically buy it in their personal names. But of course, those we'll leave those to accountants, uh, financial advisors, brokers, etc. Right. So I'm going to set those aside and talk about probably the let's say let's see the bigger ones. Right. There's a couple levels to it. So the one of the biggest mistakes people make is only looking in their backyard. And I say only because it doesn't mean that you don't have to look in your backyard, but it's not the only place, right? So only looking in the backyard, probably the biggest mistake. And it's not like I'm a fundamentalist and I say you should never look in your back backyard, but what are the chances statistically that your area is within the 1% of top suburbs in Australia, right? That's one thing. Probably one. So the chances are pretty low. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Good math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. So if, if you buy in your backyard, you have a 1% chance that that's going to be in the 1% top performing suburbs within Australia. How good are we really at Dash Dot at getting in the top 1%? I mean, I've looked at the numbers and we keep seeming to outperform the market by double digits in a lot of places. So I'm going to report the other day, it showed growth uh, in the greater capital city areas in Queensland, which obviously means Brisbane, greater capital city, and the suburbs that we'd had our clients invest in at Dashdot had outperformed the average by about 10%, which is a lot, right? And very consistently, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable. It's a lot, right? So, so what are the chances that you're going to 
outperform the market by 10% by going, well, I really know this suburb. I mean, this is, this is a story that's close to home, right? Because what I've, what I've told you, those parameters are very, very close. I've tweaked a couple of numbers, but it's very, very close to what I went through back in about 2010, um, 2010, 2011, buying the first home and then buying the first investment property. And at the time, I thought this is, this is what everyone does. This is the smart way to do it. We set everything up the way people told us, found another property in the same suburb. Uh, what are the, ch- I think, look, I understand what you're saying. If I could wind back the clock, I definitely think is it a smarter move to look at least around all of Brisbane, because that's where I was, um, at least to look around throughout the entire city. But I think more to your point, if I really want the growth, all of the numbers keep on showing when we when we look at our reports and things like that, that the suburbs where you're looking at better growth and better cash flow, it wasn't Brisbane. As it's, not, it's not Brisbane at the moment, right? And we're not saying it will never be. Right. We're just saying that it doesn't necessarily have to be. So why constrain yourself unnecessarily? That's the mistake. Would you say that that is the big mistake or is there more to pack in here? Well, I mean, it is the big mistake, but first of all, there's more to pack. Second of all, even with this mistake, there's a couple levels to it because you can, you can do this exercise and go deeper, right? Okay, let's say it happens to be that your area is in fact within the one, two, three percent of suburbs, right? But then what if you can't afford it? Like it could be that these people have a four hundred, five hundred thousand dollar budget and they can't find anything under eight hundred in, in Brisbane. That's another thing. But what if even it's in a good suburb, right? And you can't afford it, but maybe it's not the right strategy for you or the right type of property or you can get better returns for what you're looking for because there's different aspects of what makes a good property elsewhere. So if you can get better returns for what you're looking for elsewhere, it doesn't matter even if it's, if you can afford it, you know, you can go certain levels, uh, below, but also because I I was, uh, I had a conversation with, with someone recently, right? We were speaking about an article that mentioned that a couple couldn't afford to buy a house in Bondi. And they decided to rent in Bondi and buy in Bundaberg. So buy an investment property in Bundaberg, Queensland, right? And this guy was like, yeah, but, you know, they can't afford in Bondi. But we all know that Bondi will always outgrow Bundaberg and all the other regionals. Right. This is something I've heard and a I was lot, like, right? I've got, I've got, <laughs> I've got uh, a very close friend in Brisbane. We would have arguments that could go on for an hour or two. And he would be saying, no, 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 blue chip, close to the city, blue chip, close to the city, you can't go wrong. And it's sort of like, well, yeah, but we're, we often talk about right property in the right place at the right time. And those blue chip suburbs, they aren't consistently growing in a way that's going to support a portfolio, right? They, they sort of jump and then they can stay flat for like four or five years and then they might jump again. They're, they're, um, they're, they're tricky. They, they feel like, you know, depending on what your time frame is, right? If you're looking at a 30, 40, 50 year time frame, you don't really care how long you get there, right? If it's your 11th property or something like that, cash flow is taken care of, then sure, you know, great, blue chip's good. But if it's your first or second or third, it doesn't feel like it's likely going to be the optimal property for you to be getting at that particular time. Yeah, exactly. Because maybe over the long run, Bondi will certainly perform. It's a place to be, everybody, you know, but we don't, we are location agnostic. We don't have any biases. We only care about the data. And that is because num- numbers don't lie, right? And they, numbers don't have emotions. The f- actual fact about this story was that in the last two years, Bondi ha- has gone backwards by around 2.6%. This is 2022 and 2023. In the same period, Bundaberg went up by 33%. So we, of course, funnily enough, we were investing in in Bundaberg two years ago. So shout out to all our clients that bought there. But of course, because we look at the data and we're not biased towards Bundaberg or biased towards any region, regional markets in, in particular. We look at the data, and if tomorrow the data tells us something else because the the trends change, 
and the markets move and the demand moves, we will go where the demand demand goes. I think there is also another factor. I mean, when you look at somewhere like Bondi, uh, you could think that, well, the market's a little bit flat at the moment, so people aren't selling. And so the equity might be going up, but people aren't selling. And so you don't really, you don't see that in the data. So that is a possibility. But nevertheless, because because you find that, right, when there's a bit of a general market downturn or if things slow down, in those blue chip or very expensive suburbs, sale, the, the volume of sales tends to go down a little bit as well. And so, again, if your time horizon is long enough, if it's 20, 30, 40 years, then that's no problem. But if it's three or four years before you want to be, or, or even one or two years before you want to be refinancing some equity out of that property to buy your next one, then something staying in a flat market like that is probably going to be a problem. And I think this That's might, the key, Emil. That's the key? I, th- I think this might speak to- Yeah, well, it, it, be- before you move on, I just don't want to miss that point that you said. If you want to use that equity to buy the next one, that's where the key is. Because even if two properties have the same average growth in the same 20-year period, if one has a front-loaded kind of growth at the beginning- you can use that equity to buy more property sooner and therefore the compounding effect is much higher. If you don't do anything about it, if you don't use that equity, the actual performance over the 20 years overall is going to be the same. But if you have more growth quicker, meaning you can actually time these markets and have growth straight away, massive growth at the beginning, and you can use that to then invest in more properties, that's where the compound effect uh, comes into play. That's why it's key to have that growth earlier. And moving back to what we kind of diagnosed is one of the big mistakes. I guess we haven't got to the big, big mistake yet, but one of the big mistakes was just looking in my own backyard, so to speak, and looking at where to buy the next investment property. Now, that investment property did actually do okay, but I think that was more luck than anything else. It was just a little tickle up in the market at that time but when I, if, if I'm to look back, another problem that doesn't really get talked about enough, I think, is that if you're buying your properties in one specific area, and this speaks to the point that you just made about how you don't want to get your entire portfolio flat at the same time. You want to make sure that something is always moving ahead. And if you're buying in the same suburb, okay, well, you might get good returns there for a year, maybe two. Maybe that'll be enough to refinance another property, but you don't want to have lots of properties in the same area because if that area goes flat, that's a lot of equity you have tied up, not growing. Whereas if they're spread around a little bit more, that area might be flat. That's okay for that one property. It's done its job for a year or two or three or four. And then another area is moving ahead faster at that time. So the portfolio is constantly growing through a property somewhere. And I think that's probably even like, we love the fact that Dashdot, that we're very good at picking locations that are going to grow and where people are going to be able to get good cash flows and outperform the market by the double digits. But where one thing that has really become more and more important, I've realized, and Goose talks about this a lot, is that it's, it's more important not to get stuck. Because if you get stuck, then you're just, you're just sitting there working for a salary and your portfolio is not growing. Now, if you buy all of your properties in the same area, the chances of you getting stuck, like if, if, um, if you have two properties in one particular area, then your chances of, of getting stuck in some way or limited double. So why not? Like people talk about diversification as a, as a risk mitigation strategy, but for me, it feels like it's an anti-getting stuck strategy. Yeah, but not only that, you, that, that leads us to the next kind of level going a step deeper, right? We we're talking about what are the chances of that being a great suburb or the best place to buy? What are the chances that you can actually afford it? What are the chances that you can all get better returns elsewhere and, and the other kind of returns that you need, etc.? There you go to the getting, getting stuck part, right? Because usually if you are looking at your bike here, well, let's say most of people live in capitals, right? So usually capitals have lower yields, etc. If you get that property, you buy that property in an area where you have those lower yields, it's in your per- debt that is in your personal name with all the implications that 
that has, et cetera, you might find that- What are those implications? Just to, just to spell it out for us. Okay. Well, non-income producing debt, right? Uh, tax implications of that that I'm not going to mention, but from a- Right. You're not going to mention those because gr- then we get into the area of financial advice. So this is probably a good time since it's 2023 and you, uh, 2024 and you need a disclaimer for everything these days. <laughs> yeah. Nothing that we say today is financial advice. And when we refer to things as being mistakes or anything like that, those are not, that's not financial advice. We're not advising you not to do anything like that in any kind of formal financial advice terms or anything like that, right? This is, <laughs> this is what we call general advice. That's so, right. So anyway, as you want to- Of course, we can give you property advice, but- that's what we're here to do, right? So, you know, apart from tax benefits, you know, non-income producing debt, not non-income producing asset, et cetera, which is your principal place of residence, you usually buy it in your personal name. You usually cannot isolate that debt, et cetera. You usually uh, have lower yields, et cetera. All those things are going to kill your borrowing capacity. And what- Okay. Tell, tell me about the borrowing in your own name. Like if it's, if it's my house- or my wife and I have a house, why shouldn't it be in our own name? Well, again, I'm going to be careful with financial advice, but if you buy in your personal name, you cannot isolate those liabilities because it's your personal name. If you buy income-producing assets, income-producing debt, you you structure the purchases in in trusts, companies, etc. Essentially, that's not you. That's a separate entity that you could potentially isolate the liabilities of that entity and therefore not held accountable for those liabilities. And if it washes its own face, et cetera, you can then essentially borrow again and again. I want to be very careful with my words because, of course, this depends for everybody. Check with your broker, check with your accountants, et cetera. I I can help you out here because we have had a couple of podcasts recently, a couple of fantastic podcasts, uh, one with Omar Sonaro, Who's a um, who's a mortgage broker? Um, really smart, really fantastic guy. And uh, we've also had another one with Stephen McClatchy as well. I've known Stephen McClatchy since two thousand and eight, and he's impressed me a lot every time I've ever spoken to him or interacted with him. So we've got some really really smart guys, uh, and they've done they've done podcasts. And one of the key things that came out of that is when you buy in your own name, then when they're filling out the forms and working out how much you can borrow, then they come out with number X. If you buy in a different structure, whether it's a trust or however they set it up, if they set it up differently, then the amount that you can borrow becomes Y and they're different. I don't think they should be. (laughs) I mean, it's still you borrowing it, but that's just the way the financial system works. And so if you can set things up right from the beginning, which might not necessarily be in your own name, then you can borrow more. Uh, when it comes time to get your next property, you, it, it's different uh, and you can potentially borrow more again. And when you do it again, you, you can continue this little game. Whereas if it's in your own name, each time it's like, well, the amount that you can borrow ends up being a little bit less because of the way finance companies evaluate you. Now, again, not financial advice, uh, but those those two podcasts, we'll make sure that there are links in the show notes uh, with Onar or with Stephen. They're really, really good if you want to get a, an idea of, of how this stuff works. Uh, yeah. And, and that's the thing. Like, It not only can eat up your borrowing capacity a little bit less, a little bit, no, it can actually kill it forever. So that's why uh, good brokers tell us, like Steve McClatchy tell us, build your investment portfolio first. And then use that to buy your forever home or your uh, principal place of residence, et cetera, right? Because if you do it the other way around, first of all, usually people want to live in the best house they can afford. So they you usually max out their borrowing capacity and buy the biggest home they want. They, they can rather. So therefore, they use up all the borrowing capacity in their personal name in a non-income producing asset and they're done. So a lot of times they cannot of borrow like anymore. More. What I did back in 2010, what most people do you the first the first property purchase that you make is your personal place of residence and what you're saying is that that's not the smart move that's right i know we and the thing is it's not my opinion also i i try to be very analytical and let's say objective and we have modeled over 900 i would say 
we have more portfolio growth plans for over 900 clients and plus all the other versions and, and, and tests that we've done in the background. So over a thousand, maybe more. And I have seen the patterns. I have seen what a portfolio looks like getting the principal place of residence first versus after. It's not even an opinion that I'm I'm trying to uh, this is, give this, this advice like to people. Again, we right? have seen it. <laughs> exactly. We have seen it in the numbers over and over again. I have seen the patterns. We have seen it so many times for me to understand very clearly how it works without an opinion, just by the objective facts. So buying the principal place of residence first, you would say is a mistake, but emotionally, emotionally, I know. like you, you're 30, you want your own home. You want to be able to have pets without having to ask someone for permission. You want to be able to bang nails in the wall so you can hang up pictures of your family and stuff, right? So there's, there's all of this emotion attached to this idea of, of having your own home. Great. How big is that? How important is that versus financial freedom, financial security, uh, spending more time with your kids, s- quitting your physically hard job? How is that versus, oh my God, I can't, I don't know, hang a, a, a painting o- on the wall? Well, how much how much of a difference does it does it make in terms of years, right? Let's say let's go back to the thirty year old, right? The thirty year old who may or may not have been me. Let's go back to the thirty year old, and uh, let's imagine that the goal there is to get three million in equity, because the thinking is three million in equity at a very conservative five percent yield is going to produce one hundred and fifty thousand. It's going to replace the income, right? The combined income of one hundred and fifty k. So let's go back and think, right? Well, three million. If I, I, I bought my principal place of residence first, how much does that then set you back from achieving that goal? Potentially. Yeah. The, again, there's a few levels to this. Let's see. So the difference between a good plan and a great plan could be the difference between achieving your goals like in 15 years versus 30, for example. Right? That is, you have a good plan and you get there in 30 years, or you have a great plan, and you get there in 15. But if you don't have a plan at all, you might get stuck in one or two properties and you would never achieve your goals. Okay. So potentially, buying your principal place of residence, from the way you just described it, sounds like it could be adding 15 years to my property journey. Oh, yeah. Specifically, principal place of residence. I mean, Emil, I've seen in plans that we have modeled, principal place of residence, killing a portfolio forever. And the only way to get to the goals would have been getting rid of that principal place of residence, reinvesting, and then once you have the necessary properties, then focus on the principal place of residence. A lot of our clients have literally either discarded the idea of looking for a principal place of residence, or they have sold the principal place of residence and then decided to rent and invest because they have seen in our modeling or they have realized by themselves that it's the only way to achieve their goals. Okay. That's a that's a tough choice for a lot of people because I think the emotional attachment to having your own home, being able to do whatever you want with it, not having not having, you know, oh are we gonna get the lease renewed? How much is the rent gonna go up? Everything associated with with renting, you know, your agreements, everything like that. Oh, we're locked in for two years, what happens if something changes? All of that stuff. It's so strong, particularly in Australia, particularly in New Zealand, this this idea that you want to have your own home, lord of your own castle kind of thing. But when you frame it in terms of, well, if you do that, you can end your property journey like that, or you could be adding five years. Now, how I, I guess at that point, you need to- Best be, case scenario, yeah. You, you need to be thinking like, how much do I really want my own place now which is probably on an outer suburb if it's your first property, right? It's not your forever home. It's not the place that you want. It's, it's a stepping stone anyway. But how important is it just to have your name on the title of the house that you live in versus the five years or the 10 years or the 15 years that it can save on your property journey? So now we get into the topic, I guess, of you You mentioned rent vesting. And rent vesting is, it's become a really big topic now. Uh, I know Goose and Gabby recently did a podcast on that. It was a fantastic podcast. So 
I recommend um, if you're listening to this, you may well want to check that out. We are uh, we also have a rent vesting calculator, so you can work out uh, how much you might be able to save or be better off. Uh, and so we'll make sure that's in the show notes as well. And Goose and Gabby are actually doing another podcast. So if you have questions about rent vesting, um, it'd be great to hear what those are uh, because they're doing a, a rent vesting part two. Where we're going to talk about rent vesting and go into a little bit more detail uh, on some of the key things about how it works. But um, in your experience, Andy, do you want to give us like the super, give us the cliff notes, give us the really short version of how it works? Of rent vesting? Yeah. Well, basically, of course, renting where you live and investing or buying where it makes sense. We were saying again before, you might be lucky and the place where it makes sense is where you live. Okay. That's a different story. 99% of the times it's not. So renting where you live, usually paying less, therefore you can get a better, bigger house closer to where you want to live and investing where it makes sense. You will get to a point where not only you will get better returns and we see this consistently, it's not only that you'll get better growth, let's say, because you are actually timing these market cycles, but you'll get to a point, which is the interesting part, where you get more property value on the ground. When you have, in let's say, Emil, you are looking to buy a $1.5 million uh, property, uh, principal place of residence, right? But if you get yourself two, three million dollars in in uh, property, and that is actually growing similarly or even more as a percentage, is going to significantly outgrow the property that you want to buy. So in a few years, you could easily buy that home that you were looking for. Okay. So if I'm looking for a three million dollar home or something like that, some something huge, right? Nice big house on the beach on the Gold Coast or on the sunny coast somewhere like that. The way to get there is to kind of suppress that in a desire to get my own home now and just keep renting so that I can build this massive pile of, of wealth in a, in a property portfolio. And then when the time is right, then you can sort of switch over. Well, <laughs> yeah, you delay that gratification. Because also, Emil, if you li- live in these capitals, which is most of the people, right? The, most of the people that are considering reinvesting is because of that. They live in areas with low yields half or a, a fraction of what you can get anywhere or uh, somewhere else. What does that mean? When you have a market with low yields, what the market is telling you is, hey, I am cheap to rent and expensive to buy. So you should listen to the market and say, okay, well, why would I buy here? You, you might think rent is expensive, but in relationship with the price is cheap. So actually buying is expensive right now for you. So if you're renting, you're actually saving you are buying somewhere else where the yields are high and the growth is high. And let your landlord lose money, not you. I'm, yeah, I'm trying to think of like the kind of scenario where this really makes sense would be, could be somewhere like the Gold Coast. Let me, let me run a scenario by you. Let's say that um, you're really into surfing or kite surfing. You're, in, you're, in, you're into your kite surfing, Andy, right? That's right. So from the way you've described it, being walking distance to the beach would be pretty awesome for you. But buying a property that's walking distance to the beach might be cost prohibitive, right? It might be a million dollars plus to get somewhere on the Gold Coast, right? Miami, somewhere like that, where you're going to get good kite surfing um, or Mermaid Beach, somewhere, somewhere maybe a little bit south of Broad Beach. And therefore, if you're going to invest and grow a portfolio, you probably don't want to be doing it for like a million dollars, a million five, really close to the beach there for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the mortgage payments can be pretty massive. Two, you have a lot of equity tied up on one property. And three, that equity is low yielding and it might not be looking like it's going to grow. Now, where you want to invest, and I think the Gold Coast is one of those places where a lot of, some people start, you sort of start inland and as you get wealthier and wealthier, you move closer to the canals or the beach. And so, so you <laughs> yeah. can start further inland and buy some investment properties there. And you might be able to get one or two and rent close to the beach. And so you're renting- I've actually done this exercise live with clients sometimes. Okay, let's see how much is this property that you're trying to buy cost. Okay, where is it? Okay. How much are the mortgage repayments? Okay. Now, 
where would you rather live? Because that's what you can afford. But where would you rather live? Let's say closer to the beach. Well, closer to the beach, the rent is cheaper than the mortgage is where they're planning to buy. So they will actually, a lot of times, live closer where, to the where they want to live, paying less. Right. So you're paying less to live where you want to live. And in the meantime, your portfolio is growing. So you're trying to optimize for both. You're trying to optimize where you live and how your investment portfolio grows. And the way to do that is via rent investing and avoiding, it almost feels like buying your own, buying your personal, uh, your principal place of residence first feels like a trap now. And I- It can I, literally kill your portfolio. I remember hearing about rent vesting in like 2012, 2013. And my, my initial bias was, oh, no, that's for other people. That's like, no, 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 I, I want my own place. I don't know why. It's just just the way so many of us are brought up, like get your own home, do that first, use the equity from that. And if I'd known about rent vesting back then, it would be a, a very different scenario now, I think. Yeah, but yeah, that's awesome. But then it's not like we are, again, fundamentalists and we are only about the numbers and we don't understand emotion. Of course, we understand that even if the numbers don't make sense, People have their own feelings, emotions, preferences, their own life. We understand that. And of course, sometimes that's too big for some people. However, our job is to show them both ways, show them the numbers and say, hey, you, we cannot make the decision for, for, for you, but we can show you the way, we can show you how it would look like, and you can weigh in what's more important to you. Because it might be more important to you to wait a few years than be able to afford a better house and also have additional investment properties on top of that that can cover part of your mortgage and expenses and, and all of that. So on top of that, it feels like part of being really successful in property is detaching oneself from the emotions around, look how nice my home is, look how, look how big that, that investment property is, and being emotional about the numbers that you get out of your portfolio, more than what the properties look like, more than whether you are in your own home. If you can detach yourself from what your properties look like or what suburbs they're in, emotionally like being nice suburbs, right? Posh suburbs, whatever. If you can detach yourself from that and be more numbers focused, you get to your goal in the end. So I guess it's more about being emotionally attached to your goal more than your current circumstances or how your portfolio might kind of look visually and more about how it looks on paper. That's right. And when you frame it like that to people, okay, yes, you're emotionally attached to this house, to this, but how are you emotionally attached to that goal? Because if you don't think about that, what's more important to you? Like, hey, look at... And that's where people are like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Retiring at 55 is... It's way more important than... Yeah, yeah. Retiring at 50 or 45, 50, 55, I think is way more important to most people than owning... Uh, than, than getting to have, than getting to be a, an owner occupier in an outer suburb of a greater capital city, but it's it's a, it's a it's still a jump, right? When you say it like that, it sounds obvious, right? But it's still a jump. It's still a bit of a leap for people. All right. The so I think we've probably covered the big mistake, and it sounds to me like the big mistake is not having a strategy, not having a really good strategy right from the beginning. And running off and just doing the normal thing and buying my principal place of residence and then buying another property in the same suburb and doing it all, all of that, like, it just seems so simple and yet it's so wrong and really messes people up. So the mistake is, and and it's, it's tricky for people to kind of conceptualize how important this is, right? And I think that's like the key message of this podcast is do the strategy bit first. Don't think that you can just pick it up later. Don't make a bunch of mistakes because unraveling those mistakes, it's literally years, right? Sell a property, refinance it, all of that sort of stuff. Capital gets eaten up. You're slower to get into the next property. It's literally years that it can cost you by not getting it sorted out right at the beginning. Yeah, it's it's so important. It's so important. And it's, it's of course, you need you need to know where you are. You need to know where you want to get to and you need to build a plan to get there. You need there, to have the right, right? machine. <laughs> that's going to turn those inputs into the outputs that you want. Yeah, and that's another thing, right? Because you cannot do it all on a piece of paper or an hey, Excel you need, sheet. You need, a, you need actual some, someone with an engineering software, background but, who understands processes. 
<laughs> and but you need you need direction because if you don't know where you're going, you don't know if you're winning. And if you don't know where you're going, you don't know what is it that you have to do. A lot of people come to us and they're like, Andy, I, I just don't know what's next. I don't know what property to buy, growth, cash flow, this, because they don't have a plan. First of all, you need a goal because they say something like, for the sailor who has who doesn't know where he's going, no wind is favorable, right? So you need to know where you're going and then you you can know what's your direction. Then it feels like it's simple. Then it feels like it's okay, right, I understand now. I'll do this, then I'll do this, then I'll do this, then I'll do this. And it's really, really easy. But if you've gone and you've made a bunch of mistakes, unraveling that, it can be a bit of a problem. All right, let's let's move on now then to the idea of this theory of constraints and how it applies to creating that strategy. Now, we've got three, broadly speaking, there are three constraints um, that we talk about at Dashdot. And those are capital, cash flow, and credit. So first up, capital. You need to have a deposit. You need to get it from somewhere. Um, do you want to talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, well, I mean, in, in simple terms, the theory of constraints says that a system is only as strong as its weakest link, right? And then you would have other, uh, this is weakest resource, let's say, right? this is weakest link. So in, portfol- in, in a portfolio, you have, as you mentioned, three main resources, which is access to capital, access to cash flow, and access to credit or you know, borrowing capacity, access to debt. And one of them is going to be weaker than the other. And that changes over time, right? But at every single point, one is going to be weaker than the other. And you ha- you're going to have others in excess. So you will have imbalances in, in resources. So the theory of constraints says identify the constraints and subordinate the resource you have in excess in favor of the resource you are lacking, right? Okay, so what does that mean in normal language? <laughs> <laughs> well, that means is if you have a ton of capital that you can't even use because you don't have borrowing capacity, you don't have cash flow capacity, don't focus on getting more capital. Focus on, because if you can buy six, seven properties with the cash you have, but you can only borrow for one, or if you buy one, you'll hit your cash flow limit, then you're going to have all of that cash left over, for example, right? So the next property should be focused not on achieving more capital, but achieving better yields, better cash flow, better, I don't know, correct structure, so you can preserve the other two, and vice versa. So it's basically knowing where your portfolio lacks and focusing your next property or you know, zooming out, taking a look at your uh, portfolio level, focusing all the properties so those constraints are managed as you go. Okay. So how do you how do you overcome each constraint as the portfolio gets built out? Yes. Okay. So you do the exercise of thinking for every single purchase, right? What is the main reason that I will have to wait for the next one? Does that make sense? So again, if you come with a borrowing capacity to buy three, but you have capital to buy one, the reason you will wait for number two is not borrowing capacity because you can buy three straight away. It will be capital. So you will focus that property in order to get uh, more capital growth. So what is the reason that you would have to wait for the next one? Right. So how do you overcome a constraint around capital? Purchase a property that is focused on capital growth. Great locations, great assets, great capital growth uh, prospect. So, so we need to start off with the idea that you already have one. You, you're looking to buy a property and you're forecasting after I buy that property, what will the next constraint be? Is that right? And therefore, using that information to influence the type of property that you buy. That's right. And it's tricky because you can do that on a property level, which is just identifying you know, what is the main reason I cannot buy the next one earlier, right? But of course, you do that on a property le- on a portfolio level, which is a bit more. So the portfolio planning around the theory of constraints is having a look at what is going to be the constraint, not for the port- not for the property I'm about to buy, but the one after that. Correct. And using that information to inform the choice of what you buy now. So if you're looking and you're thinking, okay, cash flow is going to be a constraint, so let's get something that's high yielding. So that we can we can that uh, they can address that constraint. If the constraint is going to be capital, then it's like okay, we need a growth focused property. If it's going to be both, then you're looking for a balanced uh, strategy. All right, a balanced property. What about 
When does credit, however, I just want to get, I just want to clarify something real quick because as you said, the amateur way of doing this is looking at the next property. The pro way is looking at second, third, fourth, five, second, third order consequences. What will happen? What will be the impacts of the, this property, three, four properties after, right? So that's where portfolio planning and actually be able to model this will be really, really important because not all the constraints are acted upon equally uh, in the same way or, or with the same kind of lag. For example, cash flow. You buy a property, you change the cash flow of your portfolio immediately. But growth, for example, takes a, a bit of time. It might take two or three years to build. So the consequences or the or, or the outcomes of these assets will depend depending on what resources we're talking about. That's why you need to anticipate for when you will be constrained by that. So the way we as- actually physically do it is we model the best version that we can do, the first iteration of a plan, and then we go for every single property to find out what's the reason we cannot buy the next one earlier. And then sometimes we identify a constraint in property number four. But the way of fixing that constraint is not in the previous one. Maybe it's in property number one because it's a problem that you carry from the beginning. That's why it's so important to plan ahead and not look at a one property level. This is this is a big mistake. So of all of the... We've, we've done a thousand... Um, strategy plans, um, property plans for clients now, what proportion of those clients were we able to talk to early enough so that we could get it right from the start? Would you say, would you guess? And and how many people have already started? It's like, oh, okay, you've done this and you've done this. We're going to have a problem with property three. We're going to have a prob- problem with property four. <laughs> like, like yeah. how, how many- And then we have to have tough conversations. Like, what are we going to do about these properties? Uh, what can we do to I, of course, we identified, we diagnosed the problems. How can we fix it? Uh, I believe, Emil, that any problem is fixed. If you start from scratch, of course, we can build a portfolio perfect from the beginning. That's ideal. But we do have all the examples of clients that have come with a bunch of properties that they don't know why the portfolio is not performing. Yeah, exactly. So we can still fix it. For example, we we had this, uh, we have this client, right, uh, that come came in, you know, great guy, good business, making a lot of money. He could buy himself 12 properties, I think it was. Uh, I might have to check the numbers. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but it was some, something around the the 12 properties, 7 million in, in portfolio value, less than 60% was debt, so quite a low debt, Th- over 3 million in equity, and over, I think, around 1.6 million in cash and offsets, right? So you would say a great portfolio. It's flying. Yeah, he man- he managed to buy twelve properties, which again, of course, high income, high borrowing capacity. He managed to do that. Most of the people would would have got gotten stuck with that strategy. He didn't have a strategy, but he had all the resources. And you would think, oh my god, that portfolio would would be making, you know, would be doing great and and having all this cash flow. Well, you know, three million in equity, one point six million dollars in cash in offset accounts, low debt. He was still negative cash flow by thirty two thousand dollars. And he didn't know why. He came to us. Hey, I don't know what's going on with my portfolio. Please, please fix it. 30, 32 grand negative per year. <laughs> yes, right. So he's got yes, three million. Year, yeah. So the property portfolio is worth three million, or he's got three million plus negative. the cash. So four and a half million. He's got four and a half. So he's at three, four, three plus the one point six. His portfolio is worth four point six million. The debt on that is forty percent, something like that. Sixty percent. So. Uh, uh, yeah, well, it's around four million, four million in debt, more or less. Okay, it's got one point six sitting in the offset. So, Lee, he sounds like he's absolutely flying, and yet he's losing thirty two grand a year. So, how much? And he didn't know why. He didn't know why. Okay, and and what 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 could we do? Does this have a happy ending? Well, we'll we'll see in a minute, right? So, of course, we've done this so many times. We we've we see all these patterns that we can identify and diagnose illnesses and portfolios really quick. And we realized what was wrong first. So what we did, we, we basically, step one, we got his broker to restructure the loans and restructure how the offset accounts were uh, structured, basically, right? So just by that, not buying any properties, not selling any properties, his cash flow immediately went from negative 32000 to positive 69000 a year. 
So that's a hundred thousand dollar yearly cash flow increase overnight. That is just the power of information, of understanding strategy, understanding portfolios, right? So that alone is quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. A hundred K turnaround, most people are gonna be pretty happy with that. Yeah. And also overnight and also coming from a negative position, right? So step two was, okay, let's get you from here to where you want to get to. And of course, we created a plan that took him to $290,000 of yearly cash flow within five years. Of course, your average investor might not be able to do this. This guy had a lot of resources, thankfully, but he was also open to let us work on what we do best. And of course, uh, create that uh like plan with a bit of flexibility. So that's over the course of five years, getting someone from negative 32 to positive 290. How far How far through the plan are we at the moment? Seven, eight months, I think. And, and how's it going? It's going great. Uh, I think we are by probably number two, if I'm not mistaken, and we're on track to to achieve those goals. Yeah. This is interesting because one thing, one thing that's popped up, because so many clients have already made some of the mistakes that we've talked about in this in this episode, one thing that it has been sort of like fix my portfolio that we could package as a service. Some people <laughs> have said, right, we should really be yeah. packaging this as a service. Like how do you how do you fix up someone's portfolio properly and create that kind of turnaround? Now, his situation sounds unique because of the numbers, but it's not unique in terms of the scenario. A lot of people have a portfolio that's underperforming or constraining them in some way. A lot of people don't actually know why. Right, you go along and you fill out some forms with a bank or with a with a, and, and they say, "Oh no, you, you you've been declined," and you're like, "Why? Why have Why have I been declined?" And then you talk to a mortgage broker and he says, "Oh, um, yeah, we, I can't I can't get that over the line." And you say, "Why?" And he'll tell you what the constraint is. Right? He'll say, "Oh, look, your cash flow is a bit low." And then you think, well, "Well, what do I do about that?" Whereas, how do I translate this? Yeah, well, how do I? T- well, what's the what's the action that I should perform? Whereas when people come, they talk to our our strategy team. It's like, okay, well, we know what you need to do, or at least we can tell you what we recommend, and then you can make some decisions. It might be disposing of a principal place of residence. It could be rent vesting for a little while. It could be buying in a different location, targeting something that's growth oriented or uh, cash flow oriented. Uh, there are so many ways of fixing up a portfolio, but it really comes down to making sure you. You're working with people that have done a lot of it before and are getting results and know how to sort of solve that problem. Yeah. And I think that's why the hardest part is knowing what to buy. What do I need? Because once you know, all you got to do is match it with what you see out there, right? And the hardest part is for people is knowing what's the property that I need next or what set of properties do I need. And it works for this particular client with loads of resources. It works with client with more modest resources that are just getting started. Um, and that's why identifying the constraint, the main constraint is so, so important. And a lot of people get it wrong. I, can I give you an example of another client where, because I'm just thinking about these guys, I remember very, very clearly. And it was kind of the opposite in the sense of a bit more modest resources, just getting started, etc. So these clients came through and almost they almost got themselves stuck, right? That's the thing. They almost got themselves stuck in property number one. Why? Because they almost bought the wrong property. They almost n- not identified what the main cons- their main constraint was. So they came in with a yearly savings of around $12,000. That's about $1,000 a month that they could save and they were willing to save towards property, right? So, and they just had enough capital to enough cash that they have saved to buy one property right so they were they were they were telling us hey you only have a thousand dollars a month to save and to contribute we don't we're not able to sustain that much of uh negative cash flow we are worried about the holding costs etc so we think we need a cash flow property if they would have done that they would have risked course, misidentify the constraint and getting stuck forever. Why? Let's think about it this way. Let's say we do get them a cash flow property, which we can do. So they, let's say, get closer to cash flow neutral. And in order to do that, we go to an area 
where we, we're not very confident on growth. We have to go a little bit outside of our normal kind of set of growth markets. And let's say they actually get pretty close to cash flow neutral, maybe a little bit negative, but the property doesn't grow. Emil, they save 12000 a year. It would take them another 10 years at least to, to save up for the next deposit. So their actual main constraint was not cash flow. We can buy them a property in a growth area, you know, that they can afford for $12,000, no problem. But if they overdid it, they were scared and they would go on uh, uh, neglected growth, they wouldn't be, they might get stuck for the next 10 years. So what actually we model for them was more of a balanced property, of course, to manage that cash flow, but to solve the main problem they had, which was capital. They don't have a reliable way of, of creating that capital. So what we did now is essentially the outcome was they could actually get to, instead of two properties, let's say it takes them t- 10 years to get to property number two, that's two properties in 10 years and never achieving their goals versus eight properties in 10 years and achieving financial freedom within the 10 years. So that's a massive difference. That's how important it is. Okay. And so I guess what we're saying here is that if you don't have a strategy, a really great strategy, and I think that's really the message of this whole podcast, the big mistake is not having a great strategy and running off and doing stuff and thinking, oh, well, it's property, everything will be okay in the end. And sometimes it won't be. And then people get burned, so then they give up. And so having that strategy in place is absolutely super important because there are problems waiting for you down the road that you may not even know about at the moment. They they might be on the third or fourth property, and right now the decisions that you're making can affect that. And even if you know what the constraints are, because we've just said what they are, right? Capital, cash flow, and credit. Even if you know what the constraints are, Sometimes people don't realize which one is the constraint that they're facing. They think it's cash flow when it's actually capital. It's like, no, no, you need the growth. This is why you need the growth. And that's not information that comes from a lot of other places, right? Most people that work in this space, they're like, oh, yeah, get get this kind of property. And and they are they possessed by some mantra about like positive cash flow only or, or something like that. But if that's not the constraint, how does that help you? Or the opposite for that matter, or capital growth only. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's about not being not having any bias towards a specific type of property, a specific type of asset. What is the outcome that you need? Then we will find what matches that outcome. But the problem is if you got other people that they only do blue chip or they only do cash flow positive, then you know, what's that saying that says to a man with a you, you gotta to help a man me on with this a hammer, one. Every to a man, nail. that's the one. I was going to say limited options produce limited outcomes, and so if you're limiting yourself to positive cash flow only, it sounds great, but you're probably limiting your outcome in some way because at some point in your journey, capital is going to become your constraint. If you limit yourself just to high growth properties in blue chip areas, then you're you're limiting yourself again because at some point cash flow will almost certainly be a constraint, right? Unless, right? And, and and so limiting- Unless, exactly, unless you have unlimited cash flow, unlimited savings, and it, it depends on what you have, what's, what are your circumstances. That's why we you have to be completely open and agnostic. Take, it takes things as how they are and understand that because everybody's different. Everybody's resources are different. Well, that sounds like a really great note to, uh, to finish up on. Thank you very much, Andy. This has been a real pleasure. It's been eye-opening. I really liked hearing about the stories. And uh, for anybody listening, um, we have the uh, owner, Serrano, and Stephen McClatchy podcasts that you might want to check out as well, where they go into a little bit more detail about some structuring. And there's the Renvesting podcast as well with Goose and Gabby, where they go into that in a lot more detail, because that does seem to be a big key that can really unlock a lot of potential within a, within a portfolio. We'll also make sure that the Renvesting calculator is linked in the show notes as well. So by all means, check that out and see much, see how much, how much, see how much better off you can you can be uh, if you um, if you decide to rent vest instead of locking yourself into the idea of having your own your own home, having your personal uh, principal place of residence. Alrighty, thank you very much, Andy. It's been an awesome. absolute pleasure. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll see you. It's on, been a, on absolutely fantastic. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye bye.